Hi everyone, Dr. Gary here. So I'm here with the amazing Cassandra Bankson. She's a medical esthetician and she has an amazing YouTube channel that you guys all have to check out. And she brings up really, really great points about all types of skincare related things. And she talks about her own story with acne, similar to how I talk about mine with hair loss. And she's just been a great influence, I think, for YouTube and for everyone out there. So make sure to check her out. And she's joining me today. And we're going to be talking about uh, different celebrities and some of the work that they have had done, different plastic surgeries, and trying to give context to it and bring out some of the bigger kind of talking points about the reasons why they may have had these surgeries, some of the underpinnings of that, the psychological aspects of it, not only the transformations when it comes to their faces. And we're gonna start here with the cat woman. This is Jocelyn Wildestein. She was in New York City as a, a socialite, and she was married to this billionaire art dealer businessman, Alec Wildenstein, and they had a high profile divorce. But before that, she wanted to look more like a cat, apparently, because that's what her husband at the time was really interested in, he liked big cats, and she had heard, this is what I've heard, but she had heard that he had an affair or was having an affair and she wanted to keep the marriage going. So she attempted to get different types of surgeries to look more big cat-like. And the result is a, a bit troubling. She's been rumored to have canthopexies and different surgeries like brow lifting, face lifting, fat grafting to the face, cheek implants, all types of surgeries. I think achieve a bit of her goal with looking more like a cat. But this brings up bigger issues, I think, Cassandra, you know, why are people getting plastic surgeries in the first place? And is the reason for wanting the plastic surgery important? Great question, Dr. Gary. As someone who is not a plastic surgeon in medical aesthetics, I've worked alongside and with doctors and derms and plastics. But as someone who doesn't do these procedures, I often try to look at the social implications or what psychologically makes us want to go from skincare or kind of over-the-counter items to fillers and procedures to actual cosmetic augmentations to the point that kind of take us beyond recognition. I think that you mentioned something about her husband liking cats and her wanting to continue that it almost brings us into the conversation of insecurity. Growing up with acne, I would have done anything to get rid of it because of how bullied I was. And for someone who has an internal locus of control versus an external one, is she looking at cosmetic surgeries as a way to feel more confident about herself? Or is she looking at that as a way to get a husband back or to get back at society for some reason? And I know you mentioned she's had multiple things potentially from facelifts mm -hmm. to fat grafts to fillers and more. What also comes up are the complications. Would any of these things pose a threat to her health and well-being, um, to any of the nerves in the face, or even to any of the tissues. And then if mm -hmm. not, you know, when is this someone saying this is my ideal standard of beauty versus when is this saying, okay, this might be body dysmorphic disorder, or this might be a disorder, not, you know, orderly or causing harm uh, to someone in their day-to-day -day life. Yeah, very well said. I think that one caveat to um, Jocelyn's story is that we often say that we should do these types of procedures just for our ourselves and that's something that I'm a proponent of and that's something we, you often hear that when it comes to the kind of reasons why you should get any kind of procedure but we know through actual data out of, out of Johns Hopkins that there are external ramifications of doing different plastic surgeries. So when they looked at, say, hair transplant results or facelift results, in general, it's not just how the patient or the person then perceives themselves, but it's how they're perceived by others that changes too. So that could have implications for the types of jobs they can get, types of you know mate they can attract. So oftentimes we're saying, do this for yourself. Self, but, but we really we don't live in a vacuum and other people's perception of us is very important that's important to keep in mind but also there are reasons to to not do this stuff just to appease others it's an important distinction um, and it's not a straightforward answer and like you said Cassandra there are definitely risks and dangers of having these repeated procedures both non-surgical and surgical that can pose a problem to one's health I mean get going under the knife getting anesthesia repeatedly has some sort of 
you know, anesthetic risks to your, potentially your heart, your lungs, things like that. You also have the actual scar tissue that develops in the face. You have the risk of uh, getting some of this product into blood vessels and hurting the skin and other other problems to, to the eyes. You're working around the eyes, doing all this eyelid surgery that can have, um, you know, vision complications. And, and the more you do these procedures, the higher risk, your accumulated risk ultimately is. And even just kind of looking at some of these images, you know, I see a little bit of dimpling. I don't know if this is scarring or if this could be even just like fillers um, or even implants moving. And aesthetics, you know, mm -hmm. even when performing minor aesthetic procedures or even just a facial on someone, there have been times where I've been able to feel, you know, oh, someone doesn't look like it, but they have, you know, filler here. Or they have an implant here. And we kind of have to work around that, even if it's just a basic facial, to make sure that we're not moving things or, you know, how, how recent was this filler? What type of filler was it? And when looking at, you know, her face, kind of seeing some of this dimpling, it would make me wonder, you know, is that the result that she's looking for to emulate, you know, like a cat's whiskers? Or is that a complication of being over? filled or having something like Bella filled, it's like a, some, it's like a five year filler, right? Like it's more permanent mm -hmm. than something else. And some of those kind of concerns that come along with it. I love cats, you know, definitely, but it's not something that I would consider aesthetically pleasing or aesthetically beautiful. But if it makes her happy, you know, is it a harm to her health or is it a harm to others who look up to her? Or, mm -hmm. you know, is this something of, you know, trying to prove herself to the outside world or trying to prove herself to that significant other? Absolutely. And the other question is, like who, who's performing these surgeries and at what point do you just say no to someone? My guess is that she probably did go to licensed professionals who were most likely trying to do their best to get her to her goals. But at what point do you say, like, I'm not interested in helping you look like this caricature of a person that I think falls on the individual doctor. It wasn't as public, you know, th these issues were not discussed on YouTube or on Instagram as much um, as maybe they are now back in the, the 90s when she was getting this work done. But even in, in private circles, I mean, doctors I think need to just ask themselves like, you know, when when is it just inappropriate to do these procedures that in a way are kind of disfiguring uh, or, or could be potentially disfiguring Figuring. That's something that I guess everyone has to answer for themselves. But I know that if she came to me with this type of request, and it could be initially it started off as just a benign request of like, oh, I want bigger cheeks, you know, and she didn't necessarily go to the doctor and say, I want to look like a cat. So we don't know how that conversation went. And then the, the other worry that comes to mind is that if one doctor said no, and she went to someone else and then they were looking at it as like, okay, well now she's here, how, how do I address her concerns? And now they're probably trying to do their best, but but now they, they're building on top of other someone else's work. And that is another issue is that patients sometimes will jump around from doctor to doctor and it's not, you know, it's not like they're going to, like some people asked me that with my Michael Jackson video, like, like why would the, why would the doctor keep doing that? And the answer is like his main plastic surgeon who has been public about doing some of the initial surgeries for him. Ultimately, he said, look, I'm not able to do anything more for you. But then Michael went and found other surgeons who did the procedures. And so my guess is that Jocelyn had something similar happen to her. We have a case of twins, the Bogdanov twins, Igor and Grinka Bogdanov. So these were two brothers that uh, had a Russian heritage and um, I think the Bogdanov family was a, was a wealthy aristocratic family back uh, in Russia a long time ago, but then they were raised in, in France and they became these presenters, producers, and uh, scientific essayists back in the, in the 70s. And they spoke a lot about popular science and, and were on TV. And then they ended up getting what seems to be a lot of different surgeries for the face, even though some of their devout uh, fans will say that they didn't have plastic surgery, it was just acromegaly from an enlarged pituitary gland. But I, I don't think that what I'm seeing here are ramifications of, of that. So the question is this with, with these brothers is, you know, they were on TV, they were in the public eye, I mean, how much pressure is there, do you think, on today's celebrities, celebrities of the past, to look a certain way and to, 
get some of these plastic surgery procedures. I think that as humans, we all have, you know, a pressure of when we look in the mirror, when we compare ourselves to others. But unless any of us are celebrities, I don't think we can fathom what it actually feels like to be constantly judged or even to have, you know, an agent point out like, oh, you should get this, this and this done, which I know has happened to some of your patients. I think that it's also important to discuss that when we're on camera, you know, the camera actually changes our face shape. If you look at yourself in a cell phone, it's actually going to look different than a regular camera based on just how that lens distorts things. I wonder if that impacted the way they viewed themselves. Now, what's also interesting is that seeing as they are twins, could there be a psychological component of their mental health and psyche that is carried on in the family, such as body dysmorphic disorder or such as, you know, a need to go to the extreme? I agree, you know, not being a doctor who does not diagnose nor treat, I'm not here to diagnose or not diagnose something like acromegaly, but not seeing, you know, the same, like, you know, um, hands, seeing other things that we, we would normally see with a disorder like that, or, you know, other heart issues, etc. This definitely looks like a lot of chin implants, maybe fillers, different augmentation. And you do wonder, is this psychological? Is this something to do with the pressures of being on TV? Or is this just a personal choice? But the fact that there are two twins, it does kind of bring that psychological component in, uh, which I, I think is interesting. Yeah, for sure. And it's a good time now, I think, to talk about implants, implants into the face. You know, I, I have a lot of issues with facial implants. I, I really do. I'll tell you why and then, uh, you know, maybe you have your, your own views on it. But my concern is that the, the implants don't change with time. You know, the implants are these fixed sized items that you're putting into the face. And a lot of our, you know, face structure does change over time. The bone, everything pretty much starts to get more brittle as we age, bone structure changes, fat resorbs, skin stretches and sags, and the implants are still the same size. They, they don't change. So oftentimes I find that it creates a lot of facial distortion, and especially with cheek implants, Patients are often not that happy with their results. It's very hard to get it just right. And they're coming in for revisions frequently. So oftentimes these implants are just not giving us the results that you know, patients want or that personally I find pleasing to the eye. So I think you have to break down facial implants into the different types that are most commonly used. You have cheek implants, that are put in. You have jaw implants, but jaw implants can take on different forms. So the most, in my opinion, subtle, benign type of implant would be like a chin implant. I think it does a lot to complement the face potentially for someone with a really recessed jaw that isn't interested in like genioplasty surgery, surgery to the actual bone. If they want a simpler solution, a chin implant is not a bad idea. It can really recreate a much better contour to the neck. It can also restore balance between the nose and the chin, especially on a profile view. A lot of times people come in, they think that their nose is overly projected, but it's really because their chin is so recessed back. And so that to me is a nice addition and oftentimes is, is a very natural look. But then you have like complete jaw implants that go all the way back to the angle. And oftentimes that can look a bit artificial, especially over time. You have lip implants that people put in, silicone lip implants, and then you can do implants into the actual soft tissues, like to the nasolabial folds. And oftentimes that just doesn't look good over time. Time. and some people put in implants into the temple area which again looks very fake so in my opinion there are some implants that can work well but most of these silicone implants just end up not being a good idea that's my personal take um, the way I kind of approach it in my practice from what you've seen Cassandra with patients who may have gotten implants and what do you think from like an aesthetic perspective? So from like derm patients or clients, I have seen a few people with implants and I think it definitely depends on the case and the person. I also think that body, you know, for abs, it's, it's different than face, but usually for facial implants, I can feel them. You can often kind of see them. You can see the angle, especially with the cheek ones or even with the chin ones. And then sometimes there are scars, you know, depending on if people had multiple procedures as well as the implants. Sometimes people mm -hmm. will go in for multiple things. And a 
lot of people come to try to get, you know, chemical peels or treatments or laser for certain, you know, scar tissue. And that can be, um, you know, frustrating for some. Mm -hmm. um, you right. know, working more in the aesthetic side and what a lot of derms and doctors that I work with recommend are, you know, non-surgical options. Some things like fillers can help, but some people don't even realize like Botox can actually change the way, you know, your jaw looks based on how muscles are contracting. You know, Botox can, you know, lift certain things or it can cause drooping depending on how it's done. Thread lifts aren't my favorites for multiple reasons, but there are some thread lifts, barbed or unbarbed, that can, you know, be uh, put into the face and actually cause tightening, but that can also kind of create a look um, where you're basically pulling skin above the zygomatic process and you can make that bone look more or less defined just by thread lifts and fillers. And, um, you know, to each his own based on each person's anatomy and what they're looking for. But when it actually comes to implants, I don't see them personally as much. I can definitely feel them, you know, when I'm working on someone's face. And I think it's, you know, the scarring that's, um, the most concerning to, to some people. But like you said, if someone has a recessed jaw, if they, you know, are gunshot wounds, this would be your, you know, car crash victims, these would be some of the people that you help in reconstructive mm -hmm. surgery. Then some of those implants can be, you know, completely necessary. Another example, we have Jeffrey Starr. Jeffrey Starr, someone who we covered actually for his hair transplant. He claims that a doctor secretly injected his lips with silicone. Um, he said that 10 years ago, a doctor injected him with allegedly two syringes of silicone in his top and bottom lip without his knowledge or consent. He wanted bigger, fuller lips, but he didn't want them to look exactly like they did after the silicone. One thought I had after reading that was, do you think, like this whole idea of someone secretly doing something, I mean, how much is it that maybe the doctor was really putting something into the syringe that he wasn't telling the patient versus maybe Jeffrey not asking what was going into his face, which I've come across before too. Patients are like, I have no idea what they injected me with. Well, when it comes to lips, you know, like you said, there's silicone, but there's also hyaluronic acid. That's usually what's used like Juvederm, Restylane. Um, elsewhere in the face, you could have things like Sculptra or Bellafil, which is much more permanent. Again, the question that would come to me is, was this person a licensed dermatologist, doctor, or plastic surgeon? Was this uh, a nurse or MP operating underneath the scope of a doctor or derm? Or uh, you know, was this something that was kind of one of those, um, you know, kind of closed door procedures, which does happen. There are some people who, you know, uh state their medical licenses incorrectly. We've had a lot of people, especially in, in certain areas, who have died because they've seen practitioners that are no longer licensed or go to other countries for surgeries or for procedures. Mm -hmm. There are other people who don't want to spend the same type of money and they think that, you know, getting things injected into certain areas of their body is safe. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, there are very few, but some practitioners who don't practice with honesty and uh, there are adulterated products. For Jeffree Star, I definitely think that he has an influencer look. I do respect the fact that he's been very open about the procedures that he's had done and actually taking people mm -hmm. behind the scenes. And when you actually look at, you know, the YouTube video he discussed this in, um, they couldn't use hyaluronidase to break this down, that enzyme that, you know, helps to degrade mm -hmm. fillers. But it looks like they actually had to remove you know, tissue or tissue in mass. Mm -hmm. And so the question becomes, what kind of silicone was injected? And would any would any practitioner or would any reputable practitioner, you know, knowingly inject that into someone? And that's not putting blame on said patient. That's not putting blame mm -hmm. on specific injectors. It's just like, th this is the importance of these conversations and patient advocacy. I tend to think that most providers are coming from a good place. I could be totally wrong because I do think that some are maybe, you know, just doing it for the money and what have you. But even the ones that, let's say, are just not that excited about their field, but they're just kind of, you know, trying to, you know, make a living out of it. I think even those people try to do the right thing. So that's sometimes why I take issue when I hear the word botched, right? Because in a, in a way, to me, that implies that the provider was trying to hurt the patient. And I really don't think that's mostly the case. I, I, I think the majority of people who are doing these injections or, or cosmetic surgery are trying to do a good job, right? Whether it's for the reputation or for their business or or just, you know, out of goodwill. I mean, they're, they're trying to help someone. So that's how I, I tend to, to think about it. But there are probably some aberrations where there are people trying to like hurt someone and, and put something into a mix that, you know, that, that they didn't, that the patient never expected. But if we just take for a second the notion that most likely his provider was trying to do the right thing and maybe, again, putting myself in, in the shoes of the provider, maybe he was trying to create a longer lasting result 
for Jeffree Star. Maybe Jeffree Star mentioned that, oh, like, oh, this only lasts for six months. I'd like it to last longer. And so it could be that it was coming from the right place, but maybe it wasn't explained fully. I find that some providers do a poor job of explaining what they're actually doing to their patients. And sometimes taking the extra time to say, look, in order for, for it to last longer, this is what I have to do. I have to put this other substrate and other product into this mix. And then there should be a conversation between the provider and the patient. Well, what, what is that substrate? What are the pros and cons? Oftentimes these conversations aren't had. It takes too long. It's, a, it's not convenient for the flow of the day. It's, you know, whatever the reasons might be. And, and that, can be troubling. And then it's interesting to talk about, well, what can be done when you have this silicone in, in your lips? And like you mentioned, Cassandra, there's no easy way to dissolve it. And then we're going in and we're cutting it out. But what patients often don't realize is that when you cut it out, you're not like making an incision, getting in there and seeing silicone just pop out at you as this like white substance. Like it just, the, like that's the conception in people's minds um, when they come to me for, for this type of uh, silicone removal. What they don't realize and what I try to educate them on is that it's really a lip reduction that we end up doing. So we're removing a portion of the red lip and it's not really so much I'm targeting the silicone, I'm kind of targeting the, the byproduct of that silicone floating around and creating different nodules over time. And that's the other thing is that any kind of filler over time in the lip can distort, create nodules, cause problems. So it's not just what you see immediately, it could actually look quite good early on. And then later on, the problems can surface. So that's some of the elements when it comes to silicone in the lips. There are still people, believe it or not, today who are injecting, even some doctors, especially some older doctors who feel that it's it's a good option if it's done well with like these small aliquots and repeated injections. I, I don't really get it, but I, I know of one senior doctor who just recently retired actually in New Jersey. He was very proud that he was injecting silicone into the lips. Maybe it just wasn't a conversation that was had, or maybe it was, I just, I want this to last. And the doctor did what was, uh, what was requested. But either way, yeah. I'm just, I'm really glad that it looks like he had it reversed. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's definitely um, a prominent figure in the influencer space. I feel like a lot mm -hmm. of people do model, whether it's his cheekbones or his lips, a lot of people aspire to look like him. So I, I mm -hmm. love that he's been really, really open about that. Yeah, definitely. And, and, you know, as the saying goes, like knowledge is power. And the more people can learn about the different procedures, the different skincare, whatever it might be, that they're interested in trying to improve their appearance, improve their lives, like I think the, the better it is for them. And, and your channel does a wonderful job of that, you know, constantly giving people the, the latest information that they can use to then make informed decisions. And, and that's what, you know, I think everyone needs. And, and so the more people that invest in that and learn and bring that information forward to their providers, I think the better experience it is for everybody. I really, I love my super informed patients, the ones that say like, I've watched every video, I've read on this subject, and you know, it's, it, it makes the consultations for me go so much smoother. That's why we, we give people all this information and we we want them to know what they're getting themselves into and it makes recovery so much better too and, and like you probably see that right in in all of your skin work like when someone knows what say a laser will do to their skin and what the recovery will look like they're not as shocked and surprised and um, disillusioned by it or that maybe some of the non-surgical work will take several treatments to get them to where they want to be or, or that, you know, if someone's coming in with, with acne that it's not like, you know, you'll give them a magic pill and then the next day it'll be better. Like there's a, there's a process to it. Even chemical peels, you know, knowing not to, to peel it off, knowing what to expect. Yeah. Let's discuss Michael Jackson. So, uh, you know, he needs really no introduction. The King of Pop may rest in peace. And we did a, a extended video on his nasal surgeries in the past. He also has had a, a series of other surgeries over time. And one of the 
other issues that he had that he was facing that definitely played a role in, in his desire, I think, for some cosmetic change is with uh, vitiligo, which is an autoimmune type of condition that impacts and, and uh, destroys some melanocytes. You can get lightening of the skin. So I think it's um, important to bring that up and something that people pointed out in a rhinoplasty video on him. Cassandra, in your work, how often do you see patients with vitiligo? Vitiligo is, you know, rare, but it's more common than people think. It's more noticeable in people who have Fitzpatrick skin types that are a four, five, or six. When it comes to a Fitzpatrick photosensitivity type, this is basically a scale of skin tones and colors and how skin reacts to light. And there are people who are a one, two, or three on the Fitzpatrick scale, but that pigment difference is not as noticeable. When we actually go into the anatomy of skin, you know, we have the top of the skin, which we see made up of the layers of the epidermis, the deeper layers of the dermis that you have hypodermis, cutaneous fat, other, you know, muscle, bone, etc. But our skin and hair and nails is made up of this keratin keratinocytes, but we also have those melanocytes that you spoke about. And those melanocytes are responsible for creating the pigment or the color in our skin. Now, there are many different people on the planet who have different shades of melanin. There's eumelanin and pheomelanin. We really all have the same general amount of melanocytes. That's like a common misconception. It's just the type of melanin that they produce. There's even neuromelanin, but that doesn't really come into conversation much. Now, with vitiligo, you can have this based on autoimmune responses. It's large largely genetic as well. You can have it as segmental or non-segmental, basically where it appears on the body. But if you look at people like Michael Jackson or Winnie Harlow, this pattern can change over time. And for people who are bullied for it or judged for it, it can be extremely difficult. And a lot of what I do in medical aesthetics is actually helping with makeup and camouflage. There are some things that can be used over the counter. There are, you know, certain brightening or lightening products. Lightening products are a different conversation because of mercury toxicity, um, illegal lightening issues when it comes to uh, socioeconomic standards that people might feel pressure to change their skin tone. And I think that those conversations are even more psychological and cultural mm -hmm. than they are aesthetic or medical. But when it comes to vitiligo, you know, there's a lot of speculation. Was this all because of vitiligo? Or did Michael Jackson undergo things like glutathione treatments or, you know, illegal injections? Did he use topical creams like hydroquinone, which you might have heard from, from your doctor, to achieve this skin tone? And mm -hmm. was he happy in his skin or was he, you know, trying to shift races? which you and I spoke about a little bit earlier with the case of Ollie London. I also know that Michael Jackson claimed that he's only had one rhinoplasty. I think that in your video, you mentioned he's had closer to 10 or even 11 surgeries. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? And do you think that it is, you know, this internal insecurity or do you think it's the pressure of being a celebrity? I think it was a combination of different things. You know, I, in my video on the rhinoplasties towards the end, I brought up a few reasons why he may have undergone all of these different surgeries. And I think it's probably multifactorial. I know that his father didn't treat him well and constantly criticized him. And he wanted to, you know, look different from the family because in many ways he didn't appreciate all the pressures and, and the treatment by the, the rest of the family. There was this also other element which was a little unique, but this desire to potentially also look like a cartoon character, Peter Pan. He had this fascination of Peter Pan and, uh, you know, almost like this dreamlike world that was maybe in his mind much better and much happier than his own. There are people who theorize, and I I guess I'm one of them, that a lot of his changes are, are ones that make him look more like that cartoon character, which is also kind of fascinating and, and unique. And then, you know, with the vitiligo, making his skin more white and whether or not he further bleached it or not, I guess we, we, well, we don't know for sure. But having those elements, those kind of Caucasian elements, and then you can see it playing out with many of the other surgeries that he had, especially on his nose, it was sort of going down that path of, of kind of a racial, interracial sort of change. I would tend to agree. And again, I know his dermatologist confirmed that he had vitiligo and that I think Paris also has it. You know, but when is it, you know, this extended pursuit of a certain facial look or a fantasy world like a, a Neverland type of story versus when is it a personal mm -hmm. choice that is enhancing his life and his appearance and um, you know the life of himself and those around him. Right. Well, this has been really wonderful. Thanks so much, Cassandra, for joining me. And uh, I think there's uh, a lot for people to gain from from this video and uh, look forward to doing more of these in the future with you. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gary, for not only your work on YouTube, but also what you share on Instagram. I'm extremely grateful for the information and the opportunity to discuss some of these treatments, procedures, and surgeries. So thank you. We'll awesome. see you on the internet. Of course.
All right, see you soon. Bye.